Okay, so with this session, it's going to be relatively light fare. Um, I had the great privilege to be in this room yesterday morning where Matt Klee from Lullabot talked about how to use the Migrate framework together with ChatGPT, and he filled in a lot of the blanks that I'm leaving uh, unaddressed today. So I'm going to have another cross-reference later, but I'm really glad that he sort of did the other half of all of this. So it's going to be about how to republish content in a documentation hub that's Drupal-based when you have many, many islands of stuff out there. So let's head right into this. I mean, organic growth happens. We all know that. Uh, most of us have probably been there in one way or another, right? And reasons are many. Uh, one team does this, another team does that. You have sort of grassroots efforts to produce documentation that's normal and actually a good thing. You may have had a reorganization or a merger that adds diversity in your technical landscape and documentation landscape. Um, it just, it's a fact of life that we have these things. So um, we've all been there um, and it happens organically. That's not the problem. The problem is at some point you have to decide what to do with it to actually still keep your setup governable. So. You know, we start out here with maybe just about three packages of stuff out there, all on their little islands. And we have a product owner who's responsible for documentation in the organization. She's happy right now because this is easy to govern. Um, as we go and move along, you sort of, you know, you get more of those islands, things happen, and um, at some point, our product mm -hmm. owner starts to get a little worried um, and is not so sure about things anymore, right? And then we start to look at what are the source systems of all these islands. And we look at this and say, Sphinx, Doxygen, Make Docs, DocFX, Oxygen, and so on. Lots of names here, Jekyll, Hugo, Docusaurus, all these static site generators and systems, there's a lot of them out there. These are just a bunch of examples. Um, our product owner is now very positively not happy <laughs> anymore uh, because that, once you put names on this, it starts to get scary. Um, also, we haven't even addressed the fact that these all live on different subdomains within the organization or maybe even entirely different URLs. It's a mess. And it's really hard to keep oversight and even harder to keep everything cohesive. So um, now our product owner is starting to think of us. So what's the future going to be like if we keep going like that? And the response is, this is not going to work. It's used in language, but it's the reality. It's like, uh, I'm messed up at this point. So what are we going to do? The proposed solution is to bring in Drupal and move documentation off the islands into a documentation hub, into a Drupal hub, and we'll talk more about what this looks like. And as a result, we will have a happy product owner again, because now you add back governance, you add cohesiveness, and all the other stuff we'll cover in more detail. So if we consolidate into a documentation hub from all these islands, um, on the islands, we were focused basically on our own source and reference documentation. We only cared about a couple of use cases and personas at best. Once you bring in the hub, there's a whole lot of other stuff that will happen. Um, so it's going to be on brand. It's all in one place. It caters to other stakeholders, to other consumers as well. And all of a sudden, you serve a whole lot more personas, you also serve a whole lot more purposes, just as a natural consequence. Or put in another way, um, if we talk about branding and SEO, oops, I didn't get all my sequencing here right, so it's going to be unbrand, because it's a Drupal site, you can theme it. It's consistent, it's discoverable, because we have great SEO and Drupal out of the box, and you can make it much better still. Uh, it's findable too. And so what's the difference between discoverable and findable? Discoverable is can you stumble over it if you make an effort? Meaning can I plug it into Google or some other service and find out that this even exists? 
Findable means once I'm on the site, can I navigate there? Do I have a consistent user experience to get to where I need to go? Um, both of these are strengths in Drupal, not necessarily strengths in static site builders, depending. It can be. Tooling, you'll get, you can keep the source tools, and that's the great advantage of what I'm going to talk about. You don't need to tell this, the individual teams that put the documentation together to change their tooling. Eventually they can, and maybe it's a good idea to do it, but you can meet them where they're at. Um, you can switch to a docs as code type of approach, which te technical writers are really happy with typically, um, although you don't have to do it. You can do it straight in Drupal if you want to. You can even mix and match to some extent. For example, my favorite use case is you have docs as code, you pull it into Drupal, and you discover a typo. And it's embarrassing because it's, not, it's live, but you have Drupal, it's a CMS. So you can jump in, you can fix the typo, and then you can go back into the Git repository and fix it at the source, and next time it comes across, it's fixed at the source. But you don't have to live with the embarrassing typo for the next two weeks of your release cycle or whatever you have. It's decentralized, as it was before, but it comes together in one point, so you get all of this and you streamline the flow and you streamline everybody's efforts into something that's much more cohesive. In terms of governance, um, so we, we get access control in Drupal, which is awesome, which you typically do not have to a large ex or to a, to a deep extent in static site generators. You get scheduling if you need it. You, can, you get consistency and, ex and also accessibility because the Drupal site <coughs> is if you do your theming right, quite accessible, um, and you know much more so than your typical Hugo site, for example. Very definitely better than Doxygen. So, lots of things. So, how do you do this? Um, the key here is to leverage the Migrate framework. Um, migrate is normally thought about as bringing one Drupal site into a newer version, like Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 migrations these days. Um, and that's definitely where it has its roots, but Migrate is much more powerful than that. You can bring in outside documentation, and um, I'll show you, you can also use it as an ongoing um, sort of CI-CD workflow tool. Um, migrate, as many of you probably know, employs an ETL strategy. You extract, so you read the uh, not Drupal or non-Drupal source. Um, transform stage, where you make the content Drupal ready. So that gives you the tools to tr transform whatever comes in into something that you can actually then store, and then load the L in the L ETL strategy is store it your content actually into Drupal entities, whether that's nodes or taxonomy terms or anything else. So that, in theory at least, works really well. Come on. <coughs> so the not so great part of this is it will take some custom code to make all of this happen. Um, a migration in the migrate framework is never completely turnkey. However, it is really not all that hard. And as Matt Cleave yesterday showed, is with the help of ChatGPT, was a, he was able to leverage his way into migrations, complex migrations, quickly, because he didn't just get the help from api.drupal.org and from Drupal's uh, documentation, but he also got very often working code from ChatGPT that gave, got him started in custom plugins to, for our, especially for the transform step. Um, but it can also be done completely manual. It's really not rocket science. And we're talking about some cool future stuff currently where we're going to bring AI to the table. Uh, I've got two of the stakeholders here in the room today. so. Be ready for some really cool stuff that maybe we can automate with AI. Not just getting the answers from ChatGPT, but actually getting it into the workflow and cleaning up things for us and making it ready. Um, so normally migrations are looked at as a one-time thing or maybe you know multiple times, but it's part of a, of a site migration. Here we're going to use it as an always-on thing. Um, and there's, there are two things, and one is here. Um, 
migrate has an uh, track changes option that you can set to true. Uh, in this case, it will store a hash of the previously imported content into a migrate table in the database. And next time uh, an updated file comes in as a source, um, it will recalculate the hash, compare, and if the hash matches, it will just skip and not worry about it. And if the hash doesn't match, it will actually go through the whole ETL, or at least the T and L parts of, of the framework, and otherwise just skip over. So that allows us to save some effort on repeat imports. And the URL for that is at the bottom. That's on Drupal.org. Um, so this makes it um, migrate ready to do sort of an always on CICD ready workflow tool. The other part that's related is the high water marks. You can use not just the file hash as the, your identifier whether you need to act on something. You can use external high water marks that you declare in your configuration. For example, GitHub exposes hashes of its own. Um, you could also use a last updated date or something like that. It depends a bit on, your, on what your source material is, what you might want to use, but you can use the high water marks and um, configure your migration uh, appropriately based on those. So you've got now two possible tools to keep track of. Have I dealt with this before? How much do I need to do? Uh, we're currently busy on building a GitHub importer, which will basically get the high water mark from GitHub's APIs directly and then only request from GitHub what we know is actually relevant and updated and leave all the other things in place. So those, those two things work really nice to make it actually true CICD flow. Um, the other part that we need to leverage here is the markdown module. Um, or that we often leverage. Um, if you make Markdown a first-class citizen as Drupal content, everything gets way easier because then content comes in in a non-opinionated way. It doesn't have any crazy classes on HTML. It doesn't do any other thing that is design or layout oriented and you bring in pure content. If you're into in the content migration game, this is a game changer really because then you start worrying about Will it look OK? Because it doesn't come in with any opinionated about, uh, opinion about look. You simply get the markdown where you know this is a heading one, this is a heading two, this is a paragraph, this is a table. Got it, done, and it, it's all going to work really well. Um, you could also go through JSON formatted content. Some of the tools that I showed you do have JSON exports. Those are great as well. It takes a bit more work on the transform step to get the JSON into something that you can ultimately stick into Drupal, but it'll work fine. Um, but um, having been there now a bunch of times, I strongly encourage everybody who's thinking about this to not deal with HTML source, unless you have a way to clean it up first. And that's just as a sort of a teaser, that's where we're thinking we can bring in AI and help clean up content before it gets into the load stage. All right, um, so let's go into a demo and actually show how some of this works in practice. So this is a client of ours. ANSYS is a company that has literally dozens of software packages out there that um, are in the simulation space. Um, they do all sorts of things from nuclear warhead simulations to combustion in old style gasoline cars to the new stuff in, um, in, you know, in electric vehicles to sensors in those vehicles and you name it, anything in between. Uh, they've got software to simulate that before it's being built. And all of their packages have deep integrations at the programmatic level, They're similar to the stuff that we document in the Drupal sphere at api.drupal.org, which is incidentally a fork of Doxygen, but has been adjusted to Drupal. Um, so they take the source code and document what programmatic infer interfaces and classes are available in their source so that other simulation packages can be closely coupled to their simulations 
um, so that you can do end-to-end -end simulation. For example, my, ex my favorite example is a company had software that helped simulate uh, landscape, environment, buildings, tunnels, the weather, um, and then it, they were coupling it to a simulation of a camera sensor in an automated car. And the question there was, what happens to the camera sensor when we go from bright sunshine into the shadow of a building, and then back into the sunshine, and then we go into a tunnel and out of the tunnel? What happens to the sensor? How fast does it recover? Is that fast enough that we're safe? Or do we need to tweak the software that drives the sensor? Or do we need to actually tweak the sensor itself? Uh, and, and change the physics of it and get better at that game before we start building the thing. Um, and so their interfaces allow that close coupling of one simulation to another. Um, so that's the game they're in. What we built for them is basically the foundations, what you find over in the documentation section where they have dozens of packages already uh, and more are coming. So uh, if we're clicking through, you know, there's, there's all this stuff that they've brought in. How this works behind the scenes is if we go to structure, you have migrations. That's normally where migrations live. We could probably do a much better job in making the admin back end nicer. But this is what we currently have. And um, in addition to all of these existing migrations, we've got this line of generic migrations. Um, and if you actually list what we have here, um, you see a whole bunch of those generic, you know, Doxygen from XHTML, and this is the nasty one. I don't recommend anybody attempt this if you can avoid it. Um, well, but we also have generic JSON, we have generic Markdown, and so on. And the key here is that instead of just executing it, we can actually clone the migration. This is a custom thing we made for them and says, hey, Here's your generic one, clone it, give it a name for the next package that comes in. And once you have that, um, basically the cloning then asks you a, a bunch of questions. What's your source repository of, of your documentation? What's the name of it? Um, there's a bunch of default uh, taxonomy tags that we're going to apply to everything. And then once that's all configured, they can run the migration. It will fetch the source data bring it in and they can rerun every time there's a new release of the source documentation. And that's how these packages come in. And we're not even close to being done with them. Currently, as you saw, we have, let's go back to the site. Uh, so live, I think we have about a dozen or so packages. There's at least 40 more in the wings, in their case, that are waiting to come in. There's other teams who have heard about this, as the, the developer portal is now where all the cool kids live. And, um, and they've woken up to the reality that these guys get great SEO, they, they're on brand, um, whereas the other guys are not, or they themselves are not. So um, the demand is building pretty much every day right now, and uh, we're probably gonna build out a bunch more generic migrations. And like I said, the one that takes stuff directly from GitHub uh, file by file as opposed to entire packages. And this allows them to have it side by side. At some point, we'll probably build a better landing page. But if you imagine each one of those cards used to be a standalone website, it might have looked like something from 2005, really horrible branding, um, not even on brand in some cases because it came in through an acquisition, still had the old logo on it. Many of these things have been put together back in the days of CD-ROMs um, and have not evolved a whole lot since then. And now they're in the new world and it, it's like it's on brand and the, you know, my counterpart on their site is, uh, has something where he can be proud of because this, this is coming together and we've already had cross-fertilization where um, not only get, do they get the governance in place, but a developer comes in here and typically might be busy with this system coupling thing and he finds, oh, there's something else. Yeah, I think I heard about this. Let me check. And says, so, oh my God, I can do things over here too, because we're also using that. Okay, let me let me explore that. And you know, interesting new things happen because it's now in one place. So it's not only just 
bringing it together and, and putting the governance piece in place, but also now that you have it all in one place, the discoverability of other things, and cross-fertilization is a thing that's just starting to happen. Um, also, a benefit that really happened here is, and it's my counterpart, Adansis, has put this nicely in a, in a podcast, is do you actually want to own your own story or do you give it to the other guy? Um, in his case, he's of course firmly in the camp of I want to own the documentation and knowledge about our products and not Stack Exchange or, or um, you know, some Reddit posts or what have you. It's about keeping this in-house and being in control of the story about you uh, because that was a very real thing that started to happen. And we see that for other customers of ours too, and I'm pretty sure that's also true in a government context or in any large organization context. It's either you and being on top of your, your own story or the other guys will do it for you and possibly in a less than optimal way. So that's the other part of this that gets really empowered once we bring it all into a Drupal site into one place and make it easily accessible and easily discoverable. So, um, what else can I show you here? Um, we're running, we're not running late at all. So I'd actually like to open it up at this point for discussion if you have any questions and we can go into much more depth. Yes, Michael. So, is your plan that the developers that write these documentations, will they continue writing in these other places? and you just continuously migrate it in, or is the end goal to actually ha them having a Drupal account and creating the documentation in the document app directly? Um, probably not in Drupal, but there's definitely going to be consolidation. Um, so, I mean, the extreme end of the optionality is they can stay where they are. We've, we figured out how we make that flow happen and they can just continue in their tooling and never grow up. That's cool. Yeah. Well, there's a nice middle ground of let's switch, come off of some of these more old-fashioned tools and just do it straight in Markdown, do it straight on GitHub, and use the new tool that we're building right now um, that will pull Markdown pages individually from there into here. So just a pure docs as code workflow without any tooling because we don't need the static site anymore. We just need the source docs. Yeah. And that's probably where the sweet spot will be. But it's entirely feasible to just do it in, in the hub itself. Um, I think, though, because they're all tech writers, they're probably much more comfortable in some sort of a markdown authoring tool and push it up to Git and have it version controlled and have all those tools at their disposal that we do not naturally have in Drupal. So, but it can go, it can go any way as long as they allow their content to bring in here. I'm sure my counterpart at Ansys is going to be happy. Yeah. Um, it, it's about the consolidation. Yes? Yeah, so uh, I would like to know how much work did you put in writing these migrations? Because <coughs> the, the, like, the destination part of the load part of your retail uh, workflow is probably the same for mm -hmm. all of them. But the extraction and uh, transformation will be different for every uh, migration. So did you manually call it? Did you use ChatGPT as you mentioned? And um, how, how much we time did it take? We manual coded it because ChatGPT was not yet a thing when we started. Um, the first one was definitely the most work, but it was also the gnarliest one. Um, so it was sort of a learning the hard way type of experience for us. Uh, these days, with the experience and possibly with AI help, it's it's really quick and especially if we get decent markdown input but from the more modern tools like if there were a static Hugo or Jekyll site or some that would be almost trivial because you can get real you know nice and clean markdown and we would just get rid of things that we don't want in the markdown like for example mermaid diagrams and things that we don't support and uh, would rather do the Drupal way um, so those would be trivial basically and we're currently thinking, here, John here and Michael and I are thinking about automating steps in there where we would do a preliminary input data cleanup with AI help. And then we 
we're thinking eventually we should be able to do a fully automated import where you simply say, this is your source, let the AI analyze it, clean it up, maybe a quick manual overview step of, okay, that looks good to me, push the button and it would rep and just bring it in. Um, I'm thinking it's feasible. We've got to prove that. It's, uh, we, I, mean, I, I only believe things that I've seen working, but I think it's feasible to do that with very minimal human intervention, ultimately. And that's what we're truly excited about at this point, but we, we, need, we need to build it at some point. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be nirvana, right? When you, when you stop worrying about the source and have the source in a clean enough format that you can just bring it in. And, you know, the cool thing about uh, large language models is that they're very good at transforming content. Um, I've done some transformations of markdown key value pairs um, into, into a YAML format and just said, I need that in a YAML format like a table of content in DocFX, Microsoft's static site builder. And it just did it, like within 20 seconds, boom, gave me a very clean one that I couldn't have done better by, by myself, by hand. If you give it a template example, it would be really Yeah, but you don't even need to give it a template example because it has already absorbed those. And so it knows how to do this. And I saw other tech writers uh, showing examples of how they do transformations, use it with AI tools, including ChatGPT, that really do the job very nicely. And that's why I'm so confident that we can probably do source cleanup and, and some templating of how we want it, um, and then basically just let, let it rip automatically. And it should work for the most part. At least, you know, get us 90% there, or maybe closer. The only unknown I have at this point is what do we do with landing pages because you don't just want to stick things on a page and have some sort of AI generated layout. You probably want to drive this the Drupal way through a view or through layout builder or what have you. But just the content, simple pages and menus and sidebars and things, that should all be automatable the way I see it. Any other discussion points? Well, that was a short one, <laughs> but I'm glad you all came. Um, hope you learned something, and please don't hesitate to get in touch if more questions surface. And again, on behalf of the organizers, thanks for sticking it out.